Prime Minister, distinguished uh, members of the delegation, ladies and gentlemen, welcome and welcome to Kerber Foundation. It's a great pleasure and honor for us to be part of your program here in Berlin. In two weeks from now, uh, Trident Juncture, NATO's largest exercise since the end of the Cold War, will begin in Norway and 10,000 out of the 50,000 soldiers involved in that exercise will be coming from Germany. And I think Trident Juncture is a good example for the commitment of Germany and our two countries to strengthen collective defense in the framework of NATO. By the way, when I prepared my welcome remarks, I uh, took a closer look at the climate in Norway um, and I found out that the average hours of sunshine per day in Trondheim in November are between zero and one. So I think uh, this time no sunglasses needed. Uh, but on a more serious note, today a strong commitment for European security and collective defense by NATO seems to be more urgent than ever. Uh, when we look at the extent to which uh, European security has come under threat again. In the past years, the existing security order in Europe has disintegrated to a large extent and geopolitics has returned to the continent. The ongoing conflict with Russia, a crisis in transatlantic relations, rifts within the European Union, instability in our southern and eastern neighborhood, all these developments have altered the strategic landscape of the continent fundamentally. So how should we adapt to this new situation? Which measures should we take? And what is the desired end state? From a German point of view, the Nordic countries are key partners when it comes to finding answers to these questions, analytically, but also policy-wise. Because they are all members of the West and they are all members of the European family, even if they are not a member of NATO, like Finland, or a member of the European Union, like Norway. In order to tackle these multiple challenges in Europe and beyond, we at Kerber Foundation have made it our mission to help strengthen the dialogue and international understanding. And to this very day, we are still dedicated to filling our founder's credo with life, which was talking to each other rather than about each other. With our current thematic focus on the value of Europe, the Kerber Foundation is making a contribution to the debate on the past, present, and future of the European project. A quarter of a century after the dawn of a new era in 1989, Europe is threatened with new dividing lines politically, socially, and culturally, some, although not all of them, along the former Iron Curtain. And we are convinced that there is no alternative to the path of integration and growing together, which began with the reunification of Eastern and Western Europe in 1989, and which found clear expression in the Eastern enlargement of the European Union. Our last speaker, actually, in this Kerber Global Leaders Dialogue series was Polish Prime Minister Morawiecki, and he made a very strong case for a stronger Europe, but it also became clear that uh, we do not always have the same view about what exactly a stronger Europe entails. We also held our last Burger of Roundtable, the 168th in Warsaw, and we had an excellent discussion, very lively discussion on the perspectives for European defense, for the perspectives for the EU budget, and also about European values. And last but not least, this year's Berlin Foreign Policy Forum, which we organized uh, together with the uh, German Foreign Office, will also place a particular emphasis on the question of how to hold Europe together. Prime Minister, we are grateful uh, for your willingness to not only address a specific issue of European politics, namely a strong Northern Europe in your talk, but also to engage in a conversation afterwards. The discussion will be moderated by my colleague Nora Müller, Executive Director, International Affairs at Kerber Foundation. And uh, before I turn it over to you, um, I would like to thank Ambassador Peter Ulberg and his team, in particular Stein Iversen, for the excellent cooperation in the run-up of this event. Now, without further ado, Prime Minister, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Berlin, among friends, I think. Norway and Germany are close allies. We are united in our defense of fundamental values. We have close cultural and uh, historical ties. Last year, I visited Hamburg for the G20 summit, a city that once was a member of the powerful Hanseatic League. The League's influence uh, extended all the way to Norway and to my hometown of Bergen. In fact, it has left a lasting imprint on Bergen's architecture, language, and culture, especially beer. It's still, the local brand is still called Hansa. But more importantly, the League connected Norway to a broader European market. Then, as no trade could not flourish without security. And the struggle for strategic control in the Baltic Sea was a constant challenge. It amounted, uh, the League acquired state-like military capabilities to ensure access to all its markets. It mounted armed attacks, imposed embargoes, carried out sea denial operations. It exerted political pressure and entered into alliances. So why am I telling you all of this? Um, to make a broader point, the Hansartic era reminds us that new challenges are not as new as we think. All challenges are not as outdated as we might hope. And their fundamental values are not as res resistant to change that we might wish. So the North and the East, the waters once controlled by the Hanseatic League, have once again become areas of strategic importance. To the South, the instability has taken hold of a belt stretching from the Sahel region to Syria and Iraq all the way to Afghanistan. And in Europe, we are struggling to keep potential divisive forces at bay. A strong Northern Europe has an important role to play in tackling these challenges, both in Europe and beyond. One somewhat surprising development in recent years is the increasing pressure being put on fundamental values, such as international law, human rights, free and open markets, and the rule of law and democracy. Russia's illegal annexation of uh, Crimea is the clearest example of this, but it's not the only one. Even in, West, in Western democracies, we are seeing a resurgence of groups that are questioning our fundamental values. Values that has been vital to ensure our prosper, prosperity, security, and our welfare. In the face of these uh, challenges, we cannot remain indifferent. We, as a society, have a responsibility to act. We, as politicians, have a responsibility to engage with our voters and to win their trust. The challenges on the international stage are no less uh, fundamental. This is why, for the past 70 years, Norway has built its foreign and security policy on a clear set of principles. And they, these principles has have stood the test of time. Firstly, we are an Atlantic country. The transatlantic bond and NATO's Article 5 remains the bedrock of our society. Allies will not always agree on all issues, but even when there are challenges, we must not forget how crucial cooperation with the US is for European security. We count on our allies, and our allies can count on us. That is why Norway contributes to all NATO's core tasks. That's why Norwegian's troops are serving in Lithuania, alongside German personnel. And that's why we are hosting Trident Juncture, the largest NATO exercise in years. More than 8,000 German soldiers have uh, defied through Nordic weather conditions and are currently training with other allies in Norway. 
And in fact, we have the joy of seeing Norwegian soldiers walking through Sweden for the first time in probably a hundred years to reach where they should be in uh, Norway afterwards. All of this is important to us because we are stronger and more secure as part of NATO. Secondly, we are Europeans. Many aspects of our history and culture are shared with other European countries. And we are bound together by common values. Norway is part of the single market and the Schengen zone. We are a dedicated partner of the EU. We are closely in line with the EU in the matters of foreign and security policy. We want a Europe that is secure, free and economically strong. And where countries take joint responsibility for shared challenges. And thirdly, we are a Nordic country. Our economic edge is to a large degree a result of our Nordic heritage, of our free and open economic systems, inclusive labor markets, generous welfare systems, gender equality, and highly educated population. The Nordic countries share historical experiences and share fundamental values. And fourthly, we are an Atlantic country and a neighbor to Russia. We are continuing to take a pragmatic approach to our cooperation with Russia. We have therefore maintained cooperation in such areas as, uh, as search and rescue, in fishery management and coastal guards activities as well as cross-border cooperation and in regional organizations such as the Arctic Council. But we have not lost sight of our values, and in these values that makes our foreign policy predictable and consistent. Since the illegal annexation of uh, Crimea, most of our military cooperation with Russia has been suspended, and we have adopted EU's restrictive measures. And finally, as a basis for our foreign and security policy, we are a globalized country. We have an open economy. Global commodities are a vital source of national income. Our merchant fleets are as present of all corners of the world. And our sovereign wealth fund, the Government Pension Fund Global, owns 1.3% of listed companies worldwide. This means that crisis and instability in one part of the world will affect Norway in some way or another. We rely on free and open markets and on respect of international law. And we rely on positive development in the global situation. So, fighting climate change, promoting human rights, and the sustainable, sustainable development goals are not just moral imperatives. They are good for our security and our economy as well. So, these are the five principles underpinning our foreign and security policy. But we must adapt them to the current situation and to current challenges. Last year, my government presented a white paper on foreign and security policy. The basic principles of our policy remained unchanged. But we made some important policy adjustments that are designed to enhance European security and to strengthen the transatlantic bond. The first adjustment we made is to increase our focus on further deepening our relation with selective allies, the Nordic partners and the EU. European cooperation cannot provide a universal remedy for security threats, but we must take greater responsibility for security. Some would say for our own security, and I simply say security because it's the security of us all. We do not want to see a Europe that is less engaged beyond its own neighborhood or that renounces its transatlantic ties. More than ever, we need a Europe that is fully engaged on the global stage, a Europe that uses its resources wisely. We must spend more on defense. We need to invest more. We need to invest more effectively, not because the US asks us to do, but because it's in our own interests. 
Europe faces considerable security challenges to the east, to the south, but also at home. We must tackle these uh, challenges together, and we need to make sure that we have the strength and uh, capacity to do so. We must all do our part. A Germany that is committed to our common security and is willing to lead is essential for the future stability of Europe. Both Germany and Norway is increasing their defense budget, and this is of vital importance. On the Norway's current long-term defense plan, we will substantially increase our defense spending over the coming years. This means that we will be well above the 20% guideline of defense investment. The plan allows us to make substantial investments in high-end capabilities that are deployable and interoperable. With our next long-term defense plan, we plan to further increase our defense spending towards the 2% target. A stronger Europe also requires more cooperation between NATO and the EU. We need to make use of the combined powers of tools that they have at their disposal. And we must avoid duplication, duplicating defense and security structure. Norway is cultivating closer cooperation with selected allies as well as its Nordic partners. Germany is one of the allies with which we have deepened our defense cooperation over time. Our common per uh, purchase and lifetime management of new submarines produced in Germany will further strengthen our partnership. In the years ahead, we wish to take an even more strategic approach to this cooperation. The North Atlantic and the Baltic Sea are re-emerging as areas of considerable strategic importance. So NATO needs credible strategies to deal with potential threats in these areas. The Alliance must retain its ability to reinforce allies in the event of a crisis. And Norway has a significant role to play in this context. We are NATO's eyes and ears in the north. We share our insights with the allies and thereby enhancing NATO's collective situational awareness. NATO strengthen, strength depends, among other things, on its ability to adapt. The decisions made at the last NATO summit to establish new logistics and maritime commands are important milestones. Situation awareness is also crucial in the Baltic Sea. In this area, cooperation with partners can add value. The countries in the Baltic Sea, Baltic sea region have different security affiliations. As a result, the region can provide an interesting testing ground for forms of practical cooperation that could develop further at NATO and EU level. A second policy adjustment has been to step up our efforts to stabilize areas close to European territories together with our European partners. Turmoil in the belt stretching from the Sahel region to Afghanistan has given rise to threats that also affects Europe. It may also destabilize areas further south. Weak governments and porous borders have been enabling terrorist groups and organized criminal networks to operate more or less freely. Instability also shapes the European political discourse. And as you know, migration has become a contentious issue in many countries. It is fueling populism, and the result could be a weaker and a more polarized Europe. It is therefore vital that we deal effectively with instability in other parts of the world. We must address the root causes of instability and extremism. We have developed a broad strategy framework for our efforts in the areas and region affected by conflict and fragility. This is not only simply by focusing on aid, but also to work on business development, institutional capability building, military contributions, and support for civilian society. 
Our human, uh, humanitarian assistance comes in addition to these efforts. But achieving stabilization alone is not enough. We need to succeed in the fight against poverty, to secure good health services and education for more people. And we need to protect the environment. The UN Sustainable Development Goals are a roadmap, or the roadmap, to the world we want. They recognize that all countries must come together to build a peaceful and more just world. Norway remains more committed than ever to pursuing a strong engagement for development across the globe. But we must adapt our methods. Aid was once the most important source of income from some developing countries. Today, domestic resources and foreign investments matter more. That is why we need efforts such as Compact for Africa initiative, which was Germany launched at the G20 summit in Hamburg last year. We need to create jobs and growth, not just deliver aid in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, as a politician, I consider trust to be one of the most important words I know. Trust between people enables us to maintain generous welfare schemes. Trust is essential when it comes to integrating migrants into our society. And where there is trust between citizens and politicians, populism can be kept at bay. But trust also plays a significant role in the international relations. Where there is trust, trade is possible. Where there is trust, countries are more secure. And where there is trust, common challenges are easier to tackle. Centuries ago, trust played an important role in the hans trade. Later in our lifetime, trust helped to create a secure, stable and prosperous Europe. When Norway seeks partners, we look for countries that we can trust in. Countries that share our values, countries that have similar agendas. Germany is such a partner and a friend. But we also need to build trust in our relation with countries that do not share our values. By maintaining an open dialogue with these countries, we will be better prepared for the day when they return to comply with international law. We should never give up that ambition. European history has shown how rapid the transformation from instability to stability can be. And I am confident that Europe will be able to cope with today's security challenges. To do so, I think we need a stronger and engaged Northern Europe. And I know that in these areas, we can count on Germany. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you very much for this introduction. Now, knowing that you're a soccer fan, I was tempted to start with a question about Brand Bergen, your home team, but I will leave that for later. And I will go back to a point you mentioned in your five principles of Norwegian yeah. foreign policy. You said that first and foremost, Norway is an Atlantic country. Um, I think you mentioned that you can count on your allies and your allies can count on you. Now, I was sort of, I was reminded of something that your German colleague Chancellor Merkel said in a beer tent of all places about a year ago. She said that the era in which we can fully rely on others is over to some extent. And it was clear whom and what she meant. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, how reliable an ally is the US in times of Donald Trump? Mm. I think the U.S. is reliable on security issues. I think it's, uh, uh, yes, they do make a lot of noise. Okay. They do make a lot of discussions. They are very um, active on making sure that European uh, countries are increasing their military expenditure. But 
if you compare what is happening now and the discussion about security issues during, with Trump, when you compare it with the beginning of the period of Obama, where we all in Europe were sitting and watching how interested is in he in Asia and not in Europe, when we were afraid of, you know, where is the European agenda for the new American administration? This administration has a European agenda on security. Mm -hmm. And I think we can trust on that, which I think is important. What is the problem, of course, is that what we would say is the core uh, elements that we should build international cooperation on is not the same as the Trump administration is doing. We believe in multilateralism. We believe in the rule of law. We believe in international cooperation. We believe that all co parties, all countries should be at the table. You know, it should be a rules-based system, for example, for trade, which is not what the Americans do. And, and by doing that, we have a challenge, mm -hmm. of course. And uh, which, we, which we say also is uh, because we believe that this playing field and trade and others through the international mechanisms should be the air, should be the focus where we are working and not on bilateral, um, bilateral cooperation between different countries. And as a small country, we know every time big countries starts to uh, make the rules between themselves, it becomes much more difficult for smaller countries. Yeah, it's the story of the elephants and, yeah. and the grass that gets trampled. You mentioned the issue of the us Europeans now um, taking their their own security more seriously, um, uh, taking on more responsibility, or at least trying to do so. Now, your country is part of NATO, not part of the EU, but it does take part in, in CSDP. It, it is affiliated with PESCO also, to some extent. Mm. Um, and I, I wonder, what do you think? How autonomous can we Europeans get from the Americans? And how autonomous should we get after all? Is there a limit to that as well? Well, it's important to remember, at least, uh, if you look at uh, Nor Norwegian uh, history mm. of when we were, we were neutral in the First World War. We were neutral before the Second World War. We were occupied by Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. Why were we occupied? Because you control the Atlantic Sea if you occupy the coasts of Norway. Why is the Atlantic Sea interesting? Well, it's because you can control material to, to Russia. Mm -hmm. You can control the whole hub uh, and, and, and ensuring you know, uh, support for different European countries. So, I mean, we, we are geopolitically placed the a place where we know that in a case of a conflict and a situation, uh, we will be... Uh, <laughs> we, we are where we are. Our geography is where they are. And we you know if Russia ends up in a conflict, I mean, securing their situation around, you know, securing their coastal line, their, their uh, uh, navies, accessibility to the Atlantic is important. But it's also going to be extremely important for the Baltics, for, 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 for all of the other countries in Europe. That's why I don't believe that you can have a European security situation that is not also built on cooperation with the Americans. Mm -hmm. And that's both Americans and the US and, the, and, and the Canadians for that. I mean, I think this is core, you know, to make sure that we have learned this from history, that it's important. I think that's, um, that's what history has learned. So can we, be become, we can do more. We should do more in Europe. Uh, and we have done quite a lot the last years. We have modernized our military systems. We are cooperating better together. We, are, uh, we have more, much more efficient um, military systems in most European countries. They are interoperable. They are through those international conflicts that we have joined in partnership, both in Afghanistan and others, we have learned how to work better together and we are, we are in fact, modernizing quite a lot. So, so, we, uh, so I think we are much more effective than we used to be. We had maybe larger armies if you go back to the 70s, but we are more effective in cooperation today. And I think still we, uh, but still we will have to have the support, I think, from the, from the US and, mm. and Canada. So that sounds cautiously optimistic when it comes to the Europeans taking on more responsibility. There, there is, I think there is 
room for, in the security field, there's room to do a lot on, for example, what I, I talked about in, in, in trying to stabilize better in, in North mm -hmm. African countries mm -hmm. on this Sahel region and all of this to work more on, on after also the soft powers. EU has a lot, vast instrument of things they can work on, which is not just military capacities, but also, also uh, on policy measures that is, is going to be vital in the future. So there will be more than enough room for European countries and Europe to engage in, a more, in more stability in the world. And is that also why the 2% goal of NATO is not really reflective of, of solidarity in the alliance? Uh, well, I would say that we, we who are support using uh, quite a lot of money on, on supporting uh, fragile countries around the world, trying to increase uh, development, we are using one percentage of our GDP in, in, um, in development aid in Norway. I think that should also count for something because we are helping with that. Uh, I still believe that we should try to work towards the 2% mm. goal, as we said when we were in, in Cardiff. We will increase our military expenditure, but we have to do it wisely and we have to do it in a way where we, where we get more military capacity for it. Because you can use more money, but you don't really get more capacity if you don't, if you, if you, if you don't build it in a balanced way. So you have to do it smartly. Yes. I wanted to ask you about Russia, actually, Prime Minister. You said that your approach to Russia is both pragmatic but also principled. Now, um, we, as we speak, um, the, the Trident Juncture um, mm. exercise is going on in your country. We've seen a massive um, Russian um, maneuver earlier this year, um, the, the Vostok 2018. So to me, that has very much of a Cold War feel about it. Are we back in an area of deterrence after all? In an era of deterrence? No, I don't think we are back to the Cold War mm. and back to the deterrence area. But I think uh, what we have seen, uh, as I said, we are the Eisenhower's in the north. We have seen a Russia that is more, of course, politically assertive in the world. They are um, what we have seen in Crimea, what their support in, in different international operations all of them show a different Russia than what we saw. That's why we also have these measurements, uh, because they have violated international law. But we also see that their, their capabilities are better, and we have to be prepared for that. We have to make sure that we are functioning in a good way. Trident Juncture is a defense system. It's not, it's, it shows how to defend uh, the northern area, mm. not to be aggressive, but to defend it. That's, a, that's an important part of the whole military exercise. Um, and, and it shows... And it's, it's important because you need sometimes also to not just have small training sessions, but you have to see if you can get all of the large parts of a military to function together. As partners, uh, most European countries and a lot of other partners were in Afghanistan. And, and what my military told me after that was that we were, became very good at cooperating on troops level and on smaller units levels, but we need more training to get the whole operation to function together mm -hmm. and, and make sure that we are training, you know, how systems in large are functioning. Um, I suppose the Russians will say the same, that they also need to train and, and others to do that. But I, think, I don't think we are into a political situation where, you know, you have deterrence and you have the Cold War yet. I think we still have uh, room to make sure that we can move forward and we should use the policy and the diplomatic ways to try to find ways to, uh, in fact, cooperate more internationally. Some people say it's even worse than in the Cold War, because now we don't have this bipolar system, the, the situation is much more volatile and complex. There is always a lot of people who live out of crisis scenarios. <laughs> and, uh, well, that, that point is duly noted, Prime Minister. Maybe talking about, um, uh, about tricky issues in international politics, I can um, ask you for your um, opinion when it comes to Brexit. We are now, um, to some extent, in, in crunch time when it comes mm. to, to the Brexit negotiations. Um, we have the, the European Council coming up. So you've always been among those who argued that there shouldn't be any cherry-picking when it comes to um, the, 
Britain and, and the EU, and therefore the Norway model, at least from your point of view, doesn't seem to apply to the future relations um, between uh, the, mm. the United Kingdom and the EU. So from your point of view, what should be the way to go post-Brexit? Well, I would say that the Norwegian model is a perfectly good model if you're not a member of the European Union and if you want to have, have it all at the same time on most levels. I mean, if you want to have your, your businesses functioning, your systems uh, being adapted. The reason why I don't think it's a, uh, it's a model for, for Britain is mainly because so much of the discussion was about freedom of movement for people. And we do accept freedom of movement of people. In fact, Norway is the one of the Nordic countries that uh, after 2004 had the largest uh, percentage of, uh, of uh, former East European people coming to Norway to work. Mm -hmm. And it was a blessing to our economy because our economy was growing at that time. We needed the, the labor force from Poland and from Lithuania and others, even from parts of Germany. We have a lot of engineers in Norwegian shipbuilding industry that comes from Germany at that time because the economy was slower there, it was high in Norway. Uh, and I'm, I'm just emphasizing that because it's, um, uh, to us, freedom of movement has not been a big issue, but it has been that in Britain. The challenge with Brexit and a hard Brexit is, uh, first of all, uh, Britain is a much larger economy than Norway is. Um, they might sustain well uh, uh, outside Europe, but it, I don't think, I think their economic growth will be slower than if they had been, and the European growth will be a little bit slower than if they had remained in, because the market will diverge after some time. You can start off with the same points, but if the rules and regulations are differing, then the markets will diverge. It will be more, more difficult you know, for the corporation in the future. Mm. Uh, so I, I hope that we will get a soft landing, you get an agreement that will uh, not become too chaotic when, when, uh, when uh, uh, Britain is leaving the European Union. I think you should do that, we should manage that in an orderly manner. But, um, uh, and hopefully, they will be as closely connected to Europe as possible for their own political um, uh, decision, because I think we would need that as, as a Europe as a whole. Hmm. Well, it seems to me that the Brexit negotiations so far weren't exactly an exercise in, in confidence building, right? No, and, and the big problem, of course, is that it was a divided country that decided to leave uh, EU. It's a division in their political parties that is uh, so big and so, uh, so it's difficult to get the political mandate for what is the, what type of an exit strategy you should have. And I can see that I really, uh, if, there's, if there's one politician I do not long for the position of in <laughs> Europe, even if it's a much bigger country, it's Theresa May. <laughs> That's, uh, she must have one of the toughest days in European politics uh, these days with the division inside her political party. And I think it went back to the fact that when you have a referendum like that, um, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of storytelling around what we can achieve, but there was no firm alternatives. They had not really had any, 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 any uh, scrutiny work done on what should the option be if we leave. Mm. And usually the lack of that type of option means people to become conservative and afraid of what happens. But this time they didn't. And then, then you are in the middle of you know, something I don't think anybody really had planned for. Mm. Prime Minister, before I turn it over to our audience, one question which actually fits in nicely because it's about female prime ministers. Now, I read in an article that you're sometimes compared to the, or, or, or you're characterized, I should say, as a mixture between the Iron Lady and Mutti. Mutti being a somewhat, you know, ironic pet name for Chancellor Merkel. So I was wondering, do you see yourself more on the Iron Lady side or more on the Mutti side? I think, I think I'm probably more on the Mutti side, if that's, <laughs> to be honest. I think, I think my conservative party now is more, is more center conservative than what the conservative party in Britain was with, with Margaret Thatcher. Uh, but also because I think the answer to the challenges in a globalized world today is different than, it, than the answers in policies were in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, my party in the 
80s were in government with Kåre Willock as the Prime Minister, and we did, uh, we did um, uh, structural changes in our society, we, we denationalized, we, we uh, modernized, we went for more open shops, you know, we were more liberalized at that time, because that was what you needed after uh, a much closer economy and, uh, and uh, after social democrats in the government for such a long time, but also we were late in modernizing our society compared to a lot of other countries, so it was over mature. Today, the biggest issues that we as conservatives have to answer is what are the challenges that globalization gives us to make sure that we continue to build a welfare state for the future. And not all of those easy answers about, um, you know, um, only free market thinking. That's why I would argue that today that uh, while we in the 80s would sell off state ownership in companies, mm -hmm. today I would say, no, I believe that we should have a, a sharehold in some of the biggest companies in Norway from the Norwegian state still, because as a small country in a globalized economy, that means that we can secure headquarters research facilities to large companies in my country. So even if it's only a one-third ownership we do have, it still is. So, I mean, the answers are different because the times are different. And because globalization is such a big impact to all of our, as, uh, to all of our economies that we have to say that, you know, these um, uh, stereotypes that sometimes, you know, comes out of the big uh, discussion between liberalism and, uh, and, and, and uh, communism from the 60s and 70s debates, which I was participating in as a student, uh, it's not the same answers today. And I think that's, that's why you will see that most conservative leaders have different answers today than if you just extracted the ideology of, of the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. It's because the world has changed. Mm -hmm. And then, happily, conservatism is a sort of ideology that also changes. Well, that's the perfect lead over to our question and answer, part, Prime Minister. Thank you so far. Ladies and gentlemen, over to you. Um, I would only ask you for two things. Please kindly introduce yourselves and please do remember that every question should end with a question mark. And I have a first question right over there. I think it's Johannes von Ahlefeld. Johannes Ahlefeld, political advisor to the German Social Democrats in Parliament. Two points. One, what's your approach to digitalization as it may be critical to both cybersecurity as well as to transatlantic trade? Second, what is your experience uh, with the Russians in the context of the uh, security in high north that Norway or Norwegian parliamentarians had been concerned about for more than one and a half decades? Thank you. Well, if I start with digitalization, which is uh, perfectly aligned with the globalization issue, because uh, digitalization, I think everybody who wants to stop the sort of globalization that comes, that is discussed today, will never manage that, because digitalization will lead to globalization even more, because technology is now driving, you know, the changes in the world. And um, what we are doing is, of course, trying to have um, both measurements that make sure that we are competitive in a more digitalized world. That is about research, development, education. It's about uh, making sure that companies are uh, managing to move over to a more digitalized and more, more um, uh, sensor-oriented economy. One of the benefits of being a high-cost country is that our industries have invested quite highly in already in uh, digitalization, already is quite, um, because the cost of manpower has been so high, we now see that jobs that they would send out of the country before, for example, uh, I'm not, well, not always you find, any, you know, when you, uh, more simple work at the shipyards is now coming back to Norway again, which went to uh, Poland, it went to China, it went to Korea, different periods of time. They are now doing it again in Norway because they can do it because of new types of technology and make it uh, and, and not use uh, manpower at the same uh, same level. That means that there is an option for high high cost countries. What we do have to look at is how we make sure that this 
does not lead to a larger inequality in our society because there will be a lot of jobs that are moved away that are not going to be there anymore. And that means that we have to invest more in educating uh, people who have been working for some time. Uh, not just thinking that we need an educational system for, for young people. We need to have an, uh, an educational system that also gives people skills when they are 40, 50. Usually I say that even 57-year-old ladies can learn new things. And I'm content, uh, in, intending to continue to be in the labor market for some years. And I think I'm a representative of that 57-year-old ladies can learn new things, and we should make sure that all employers believe that 75 or uh, 57-year-old women can do more and learn more things, because usually uh, they only give young people the ability to get new skills. Cybersecurity is extremely difficult. Uh, we are, an, and it leads to that we have to evaluate both how open our system is to make sure that we have enough security built into it. We have had attacks to our healthcare systems. We have attacks, try, people try out attacks to our research institutes. I mean, we all know that people are looking for um, companies, uh, uh, processing systems, trying to copy them. Uh, so we need to work on cybersecurity on that level, but also on, of course, on, on um, or everything that is connected to our military defense structures, and we are working hardly on that. On the, on the, but I think we need to cooperate even more in the European context on this, to, to use the cyber centers we have to learn from each other, to learn the patterns that different um, um, attackers have, and, and to try to close any security problems that we might have that is in, in also in in larger systems. When it comes to the northern part, we, we believe that we in, in the north have a good cooperation with Russia on, as I said, fisheries, uh, rescue, help systems, coastal guard systems. Um, we see that Russia goes a little bit up and down, but they have a more interest in the polar areas. There will be more activity in the polar areas, also from because the, the ISIS uh, uh, the ice belt is, uh, is diminishing, so it's, uh, it's, it's going to be more economic activity. And of course, we are concerned that, uh, um, that this should be a, a, a non-low-tension you know, area between the countries in the Arctic. And the Arctic Council is a very important uh, council for us to work in to make sure that we discuss uh, conflicts and issues in the Arctic uh, Council, but between the Arctic countries, we should make sure that this is a, is a low tension area for the future. And um, I, uh, I have hope that also the Russians will continue to see that as an important part. Um, so no concerns that there's going uh, to be a great game, a new great game in the Arctic? No, it might be after the, uh, the different, um, there are resources there, we are, they are, the Russians are exploring for oil and gas. We are mapping our side of the border. Uh, there might be an area for good cooperation if we manage to get back on a better track in the, in the future, also to make sure that we have uh, international environmental standards than when, when you have economic activities in these areas. But um, it's not an, this is an area where you have sanctions today. Or, or not, well, we have measurements in the European system, so it's not so easy to have cooperation on those mm -hmm. things. I think we have time for probably one more question, and I do see Mr. von Marshall over there. Christoph von Marshall, I'm the chief diplomatic correspondent of the Tagesspiegel, the daily here in town, and I spent the last year in the United States. I have one question concerning Russia and one the Brexit, uh, follow up a little bit. Since I saw you last time in the White House um, during your visit with Donald Trump, uh, I start with a Russia question. Uh, what is your impression of Donald Trump and Russia, his relationship? And uh, since you are somehow critical, but also arc for partnership, what is your impression? And the second angle of this question is when Nora asked whether we are in a new time of deterrence, you skipped that question. You said we are not again in Cold War. Yeah. But do we need deterrence? Is this not deterrence? So these are the two angles of the Russia question, Trump and, and deterrence. And the Brexit question, uh, have you had a 
fact-finding mission of the English in Norway to study your relationship or not, because my problem with Brexit is that I was a big believer in British pragmatism, and now in the last two years I can't find this pragmatism. I can't recognize the United Kingdom of my dreams, uh, if I may say so. So if you could tell me, yeah, they were there, they were studying your project, I would be a little bit more optimistic about uh, the next uh, weeks and months. And if you tell me, no, they didn't come, they were not so much interested. <laughs> When it comes to Russia, uh, I said that Russia is more assertive. I mean, there are speeches from Russia that, of course, um, is disturbing from neighboring countries, for those who have a Russian minority, where, where Putin is, uh, is describing, you know, all areas where there are Russian as a sphere of interest for them. Um, uh, there are, um, and I might have skipped, for, you know, the question of Cold War, I believe we always need deterrence. I, need, I believe that we always will need that. I, I believe that NATO always have to show that, they, that they, you, you don't mess with a NATO country without severe effect for yourself. I think that's, that's the basic thing for NATO, to make sure that we have that deterrence as a bottom. But if it has been increasingly we would still say that we need that at deterrence, but that we should cooperate on, for example, disarmament, on, on control reducement of nuclear power between Russia and NATO countries. We still would say that this is important, but we will not say that we will not, uh, NATO will always need to have a capability to, to make sure that Article 5 can, in fact, is, uh, is um, truly viable for all countries. And I think the last 10 years, NATO has done a lot of work to make sure that Article 5 is something all member countries in, in NATO really can believe in because they've been planning for it. We've been doing changes in the command structures and where the, there is deployment of, of, or, and training sessions. So it's, it's much more viable now than if you go to 2005 where most, most of us was looking at what was happening in Afghanistan as the most important part for that. Uh, I hope for Russia that is uh, moving more uh, into the international scene again. Uh, but I can't see any signals that it will become um, better on human rights or better on the things that we sometimes challenge them uh, about. When it comes to Trump's relations with Russia, um, I, I think Trump is, um, uh, I think Trump would have wanted a good relation with Russia. I think the Russians meddling into to political life in, in the US um, and activities have done that totally. It's not possible for them to, to do that. It would be impossible in the American um, figure to, uh, the way, you know, to have, a, uh, to have a sort of a restart for the Americans with, the, because, uh, with Russia now because of the fact that uh, uh, they're so highly disputed um, situation around the elections, around their, their, their activities um, and the investigation that is uh, ongoing. And then, of course, there will always be competition between, between the, the US and Russia in different uh, uh, areas. For example, Syria, which, is an, uh, which of course is, uh, is one of the areas that we should manage to get people to sit down and find an agreement on, but there are still uh, areas where where there's too little diplomacy today compared to what we need. Brexit. I, I also believe that, that uh, the Brits were uh, um, pragmatic, ironic, satirical, extremely funny. You know, um, we, we, in Norway, we did love all the comedy shows from, from Britain because they said everything we would never in our political correctness <laughs> say. But maybe they shouldn't be politicians. <laughs> and, you know, if you bring that tone into the political life, you should maybe have a little bit more of the diplomacy. And I think that's the challenge. The challenge is that, uh, that uh, so the way Brexit now is, the way there is no mandate really, or, or strong enough mandate for, for, um, for Theresa May in her own party, 
is one of the big challenges that we have. Uh, and they have become, for me as a conservative, um, I, say, I think they are too, too um, ideological in a way. And, and of course, anti-European in the way that they are, uh, some of the spokespersons are working. It's, uh, it's something we say to them too. I think it's, uh, we, we hope that they will find, hopefully, in the long term, I hope that they will find back, and I hope that Theresa May achieves a Brexit that is viable for, that is not a hard Brexit, and that it's possible to get through in, 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 in the Parliament uh, in, in Britain. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Um, this was a fascinating hour. Um, I learned that there is a Norwegian proverb saying that a fair wind at our back is best. So mm. we wish you a fair wind at your back. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you also for actively listening, for, for taking part, asking questions. Um, we invite you to a glass of wine afterwards. And I would ask you to remain seated for a moment so that the Prime Minister can move on to her yeah. next meeting. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you.